Thank you. Uh, let me begin with a few words of explanation as to why the two of us are sharing a stage, uh, other than, than the obvious one, that we live together and have a lot of conversations. But um, both of us come to the topic of religion from different uh, perspectives. I'm a cognitive psychologist who takes a thoroughly naturalistic approach to the human mind, namely the mind is a product of the brain, the brain is a product of evolution. Uh, that there is no need to invoke an immaterial soul in understanding how the mind works. And therefore, one of the traditional motivations for believing in a spiritual realm or a deity seems to be in the process of being undercut by the sciences of human nature, such as neuroscience, evolution, and uh, genetics. I'm also interested in religion uh, as a psychological phenomenon, why is it so compelling to so many people in so many cultures, and to the uh, <laughs> psychological question of why fiction is so compelling to so many people in so many, many cultures. Uh, Rebecca is a philosopher and a novelist uh, interested in the philosophy of science and in questions that very much intersect with psychology. In fact, uh, Rebecca's first novel was called The Mind-Body Problem, which was a sly play on words because the protagonist was doing writing her thesis on the mind-body problem and also was undergoing her own mind-body problem, namely, which is more important in a man. Uh, uh, Rebecca has also written on the problems of consciousness, and most recently, um, prior to 36 Arguments for the Existence of God, had written a uh, biography of Spinoza called Betraying Spinoza, the renegade Jew who gave us modernity, which also brought her to the attention of the various humanist, free thinker, atheist, agnostic, agnostic secularist associations that had also found me. And so we were uh, both found ourselves at some of the same occasions in which the uh, organized non-religion would get together to not pray to their not God together. <laughs> uh, but the uh, directions that brought us to this topic were, were uh, quite divergent. But my, my first question, is, uh, in a way, comes from the, uh, a question raised <laughs> in the novel itself. The novel is, uh, I would say, Nabokovian in that it has a number of self-references. and. Uh, it is a book about faith and reason, but it is a book about a psychologist who has written a book about faith and reason uh, named Cass Seltzer. And uh, at one point, Cass notes to himself that there was a glut of godlessness on the book market. And in fact, as I remember in his words, uh, books on atheism were starting to edge out cookbooks and memoirs written by household pets to the top of the bestseller list. And a question that Cass Seltzer, the protagonist, faced is why write another book on faith and reason? And so I'm going to begin by asking uh, Rebecca why not only another book on faith and reason and atheism and religion and science, but why in particular a, uh, a work of fiction, mm. as your subtitle is called? Why is it a novel, the, the, did you think, the appropriate treatment for this topic now? Mm. So um, I wonder if I can broaden the question a little bit. Um, just why should, a, why should a philosopher ever write a novel? Um, so this is a seventh, seventh work of fiction. Um, out of nine books I've written, seven of them have been works of fiction. Um, and why ever should a novelist, uh, I mean, should a philosopher, and suppose I was trained in analytic philosophy and sort of strict deductive reasoning, um, not the sort who take fiction terribly seriously, why would I ever write novels? And I have to say, I always have to overcome a great deal of uh, philosophical reservations uh, in writing a novel. 
I, I have to overcome my own training and my own inclination to dismiss fiction as just made up stories. And my first philosophical love acquired when I was uh, a, a girl of 13 was Plato. And Plato, of course, famously had no use for uh, the arts, and in particular, the narrative arts. There weren't any novelists in ancient Athens, but there were the epic poets. And uh, Plato says in The Republic, which describes, sketches out his utopia, uh, that uh, he would uh, anoint them with laurel wreaths and uh, to say what uh, fantastic uh, talents they are, and then accompany them to the border just as quickly as possible and boot them out. Uh, that the rational state uh, can't um, accommodate these, 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 these writers, these sorts of writers. And I, I'm very, uh, I understand his argument very well. Plato mistrusted en enchantment of all sorts, erotic, religious, and aesthetic enchantment. Uh, he places his faith really in reason. Um, and he was very himself susceptible to both erotic and aesthetic enchantment. He knew what it was like to fall under the spell um, of art, and therefore considered it quite dangerous um, and destructive to the rational state and to the rational person. And I feel this argument very, very strongly. And I'm always writing, when I feel compelled to write fiction, some issue compels me to write fiction, I hear, I hear Plato, uh, and he, he is an internalized voice. I always am writing with Plato in my head, and I try to write novels and short stories that he would approve of. I desperately want the <laughs> approval of Plato. <laughs> um, he's the father figure uh, whose approval I want. Um, so, but it all, so there's always this resistance on my part, and so I really have to feel very, very strongly that some issue, some philosophical issue that I'm thinking about calls for what fiction can do, which is to inject me and also inject the reader into many different points of view. Any philosophical problem really worthy of, 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 of preoccupying us and, 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 and stretching us to our limits is one that can be seen in many different ways. And if you see it in different ways, your entire orientation toward the world changes. Um, and it's one also that's not just purely intellectual, but has ties to our emotional life as well. Um, and this particular issue, which has been so much in uh, the public these days, a philosophical issue, an epistemological issue, reason and faith, uh, how can we know the nature of the world that we live in. Is it a world that includes God? Uh, is there some sort of purpose to our lives? These questions, which are uh, philosophical questions that have been so dominant in, uh, certainly in American culture, but I think also in the UK, um, the, this question of all question involves, you can see it in different ways, and the orientation that you have towards the world changes depending on how you see it, orientation to uh, the, the uh, uh, concern the way you regard your own life. And it's not just an intellectual issue, but it is knitted, in, uh, intrinsically knitted with emotional life as well. That's the kind of question I think that calls out for uh, fictional treatment. And I hope, I hope Plato will forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> in this issue in particular, there have been the famous books by Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and uh, Christopher Hitchens, uh, and now 36 Arguments for the Existence of God, a work of fiction, uh, appears. Uh, itself, in a way, part of that conversation, although the uh, book by the protagonist, The Varieties of Religious Illusion, which is a play both on Freud's Future of an Illusion and William James's The Varieties of Religious Experience, is also seen in the book as the latest contribution to this conversation. So how in particular, has um, your book and Cass Seltzer's book and uh, fiction in general, in your case, uh, added to this conversation? What was missing that, uh, that you thought needed uh, 
the contribution of fiction? Well, I think one of the things that, so, so Cass Seltzer almost by accident writes this book, um, The Varieties of Religious Illusion. And he has um, appended to the back of his book, uh, he has attached to it, an appendix that has 36 arguments for the existence of God. I think more arguments than have ever been gathered, many more than Dawkins considers or, or Dan Dennett. Um, because he also considers arguments that have a kind of emotional basis, and he tries to formalize those into proper arguments, premises, and conclusions. Um, for example, the argument from the intolerability of insignificance, um, or the argument from perfect justice. You know, so these, uh, the argument from the survival of death, uh, the argument from personal coincidences. I mean, all sorts of, or the argument from a wonderful life. Um, these are, so there are all of these arguments uh, that, that he tries to formulate um, and then tries to show the weaknesses. He probes them and he, he reveals the weaknesses of them and, um, and I think uh, does a pretty good job of it, rebutting them one after the other. So the more classic arguments, the ones that philosophers have been considering you know, ever, ever since there's been religion, the ontological argument, the cosmological argument, various versions of the teleological arguments, but then many more arguments. And this is his appendix. And I take the liberty of uh, including my character's appendix to my book. Uh, so this appendix appears to my book as well, the 36 arguments for the existence of God, exactly as Cass Seltzer wrote it. Um, but <clears throat> Cass, and I think the whole body of the uh, novel itself is arguing that um, implicitly arguing that religion is much more complicated than simply these arguments for God's existence and that you can rebut these arguments um, and it's not going to make all that much difference in people's lives those who are uh, find their meaning and find their purpose and find their home in the universe in religious communities. I have, I have to say one of the reasons that Steve and I come at these, our opinions are very, very similar, I think, when it comes to uh, existence of God, faith, and reason. But also our personal backgrounds are very, very different. Um, and I come from a very religious background, um, a very religious community, and uh, spent most of my life within it, even when I was not a believer. Um, and so I, I think that I have this uh, sense that religion is about much more than belief in God. It's about uh, ways of identifying oneself, self-identity, group identification, uh, loyalty to community, loyalty to particular uh, historical narratives, uh, uh, and certain ways of uh, confronting and quelling existential dilemmas. It's about a whole lot more than these arguments for God's existence. Um, and so in some sense, I that's what I want to add to the conversation, and that's why I have the appendix as a philosopher would write it, but the body of the book is a, is a novel trying to show how these, how these beliefs are knitted with emotions and, and knitted with entire lives, ways of being in the world. Thanks. Well, <clears throat> one of the premises of uh, Cass Seltzer's nonfiction book, and indirectly of the novel, is that religious impulses play themselves out even in secular contexts. Even if you're an atheist, you're, you will act out some of the same emotions and yearnings that find expression in religion. So what I'd like to do is perhaps introduce, ask you about some of the characters, maybe the two or three main protagonists in the novel, and uh, how some of their struggles echo the ones that we find in religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps we'll begin with the protagonist himself, since one of the jokes of the novel, we won't, I won't uh, give away the ending, but in one of the climaxes, we see that Cass Seltzer himself falls victim to his, uh, without realizing it, to his own psychological generalization that people often fall sway to religion-like uh, obsessions. Mm, yes. And this, again, is a way of I'm trying to complicate um, what seems to be the clear-cut argument for atheism, and that um, some atheists have the tendency to almost scoff 
at believers. Uh, how can they be so irrational? Um, we are all prey to irrationality. And uh, skeptics, free thinkers, atheists, agnostics, believers, and some of them have, uh, they're, they're so rooted in human nature, uh, uh, some of these impulses, these religious impulses, that they, they can be given purely secular expression and that they can pass one by, uh, even those of us who pride ourselves on our rationality. And one of these is romantic love. Um, once again, Plato was the one who sort of linked um, you know, religion and art and, um, and, and eros as, as, as being very, very similar and, and similar kinds of delusions. And my character, Cass Seltzer, a very lovable man, he gets dubbed by Time Magazine, the atheist with a soul. I mean, he has a very uh, expansive, um, uh, gentle, and sweet man. Once again, refuting the view that atheists are all hard-hearted uh, um, egomaniacs. Um, that Cass Seltzer has, um, he's very prey to a romantic a delusion, and it really takes almost the form of a, a religious delusion. And so there's, I get so in order. This is a this is a view I hold that uh, that religious impulses spill over, and that you find them in the erotic life. Um, and in order to demonstrate this, I give poor Cass, this very sweet and tender man, just a horrific love life. Uh, he's just. I torment him <laughs> with his women. And, you know, he just, so he has a former wife, for example, Pascal, a French poet. And he is religiously committed to the view that she is a kind woman. And no amount of empirical evidence to the contrary <laughs> can convince him <clears throat> that this is, you know, that she's not a kind woman. And, you know, this is a kind of, <clears throat> Excuse me. A kind of, you know, again, a a a, a metaphysical belief. It's it's uh, immune to empirical revision. You know, tell me that's not religious. Um, and uh, he's presently, when the book opens, the book actually takes place over the course of um, a week, and uh, with lots and lots of flashbacks to explain his deep, profound, and sympathetic understanding of religion. Um, but he's waiting for his current love, Lucinda Mandelbaum, known in her, her world as the goddess of game theory, um, to return from her uh, conference in Santa Barbara on non-Nash equilibria in zero-sum games. Um, and she's kind of a very hard-headed hard, hard, hard scientist. And uh, I mean, once again, he's just uh, slathered her with uh, his own tenderness and, and, and isn't seeing her. So that's one of the ways in which poor Cass is made to see uh, how religious illusions disguise themselves. Now, <clears throat> the plot is joined when another one of his love interests appears on the scene. There is a character named Roz Margolis who breezes back into his life, and an old girlfriend from graduate school who has her own a uh, secular version of a religious impulse? Yes. Um, she has founded uh, something called the Immortality Foundation. And this is going to be using biochemistry to achieve everlasting life, uh, or very, very long life. Uh, you know, She is going to stamp out the last barbarism. She compares it to bubonic plague, and that is aging. And so she, and actually every time he sees her, she looks a little better. <laughs> she's, she's, it seems to be working, but she's popping all sorts of pills and um, uh, uh, doing all sorts of things to her biochemistry to impede the aging process. So this too, of course, fear of death. Um, you know, as soon as we, we are, we are the, we are the primates who know that we are primates. We are the animals who know that we're animals and we're going to die. Um, that uh, certainly has something to do with um, the great compelling force of religion. And just because you're not religious doesn't mean you don't feel it. So here is a, a secular expression of this. Well, I was uh, particularly uh, amused being a cognitive psychologist who studies information processing as the basis of intelligence. <laughs> and <clears throat> part of the fringe of my field are pe people who believe that 
all mind and all consciousness reside purely in data processing, in the patterns of information flow in the brain, with the implication that if a device could ever read the state of all of the neurons and synapses of the brain and duplicate it as a computer simulation, it could be uploaded to an enormous hard disk and that one would achieve a kind of uh, immortality through software that after the hardware of your body uh, met its end, you would still continue to exist as a massive computer I mean, program. God forbid there were ever a power failure. <laughs> well, you'd have you know, backups. <laughs> many and, backups. Uh, many yeah. backups. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, is a, one of the dialogues between the characters of your novel compares this, mm -hmm. these two approaches to immortality to an ancient theological dispute? Yeah, so whether or not, you know, at, at the resurrection, it's the body that's resurrected or, or, or the soul that's resurrected. So and they, they have uh, this character, Roz and, and Cass, have this discussion. And uh, <coughs> Cass, with his great knowledge of religious history, compares it to ancient discussions between uh, Christian and Jewish uh, thinkers about what, what is it that survives, survives the death. Uh, I think one of the characters, other than Roz Margolis, this anthropologist in search of immortality, probably the character that has the most laugh lines, despite himself, uh, but at, the, the, at his expense and the, the reader enjoys, is uh, Cass's former mentor, and as the book calls it, his former tormentor, <laughs> uh, Professor Jonas Elijah Clapper, uh, who Ooh, is Roz the- calls, calls the clap. The clap. Yeah. The, uh, literary scholar to end all literary scholars, the most grandiloquent, oratund, uh, pompous academic <laughs> you are ever likely to, uh, well, to not meet, but meet in, in, in the pages of the novel. Uh, and he also exemplifies one of the religious impulses. Oh, so many of them, <laughs> um, because uh, he has great um, uh, interest, almost obsessive interest in messianism um, and that develops over the course of, of, of the book. Uh, but he has that kind of, he's a, he's a charismatic. Uh, he's, a, he's a larger than life character with tremendous, I mean, he's pompous, but he also has that um, authority that goes with uh, the lack of all self-doubt, uh, all self-criticism. Anything that comes out of his mouth is ipso facto the truth. And, uh, and those who are his followers, his disciples, his hierophants, also known as graduate students, um, are, you know, they, they, they await his word. And when he changes his mind about something, they all change their mind about something. You know, they, that thing, para paradigm shifts that Tom Kuhn, the structure of scientific revolution, had, had spoken about. Well, in Clapper talks about paradox shifts, you know. So every time he goes through a, a paradox shift, uh, all of his disciples, these graduate students, most he has twelve of them, his twelve disciples, um, you know, they have to uh, change their views, and they don't even realize that they're doing it, you know. But they're getting it from on high, and so I do feel I've spent most of my life among academics in academic communities. Um, and there is something about these self-contained insular communities in which uh, you have authority figures and so a great hierarchy of authority figures, and some very much on top. Um, that uh, you know, there, there's something parallel to the religious community that I also know so well, having been brought up into in it. There's something rabbinical about these uh, these characters, and so yes, he for me. Um, yeah, he's a very important character, and, and he was a great deal of fun. I know when I was writing this, and you were reading pages, um, Steve kept wondering how I, I, who am so unpompous <laughs> and so self-effacing, <laughs> could be giving birth to this, uh, you know, this gas this bag. Man, this gas bag, yes, <laughs> basically. But it was easy, and in fact, he wanted to take over the whole book. Um, I had to really put a, <laughs> a lid on him. He just kept coming and coming, you know? <laughs> yeah. Now, for all of the, the obvious sympathy that Cass Seltzer and, and, and you have toward the religious impulse, uh, and the fact that some critics have called this a post-new atheist novel or a new, new atheist novel <laughs> or a 
I'm uh, post-religious, post I mean, it's, it's post. Whatever it is, it's post. And <laughs> would, uh, and would you characterize the message of the novel as kind of agnostic or you know, God sort of exists, maybe he does, sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't, who knows whether he does or, no, or doesn't. Uh, is it a, in terms of its commitments, middle of the road between atheist and uh, religious? You know, I, I, I'm going to resist answering because I, you know, I have my point of view, and I think it, it, it may come across quite clearly. I mean, certainly if you were to talk to me, uh, you would know my point of view about these things. And, 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 and I certainly think that the appendix with the rebuttals um, make a very strong case for atheism. Also, Cass Seltzer has, towards the end of the book, it's one of the, there are at least four climaxes in the book, but it's one of the climaxes of the book. He has a debate with a public theist. I don't know if this is happening in the UK, but this is happening very much in the United States, that there are these stage debates between atheists and theists. Uh, and they're just going to argue it out uh, between them. And this one takes place at Harvard University. The, um, it's mediated by the agnostic chaplain of Harvard University. Um, and there's actually somebody a little bit like that, uh, the humanist chaplain. Harvard, Harvard really does have a humanist chaplaincy, too. Yeah. He actually married us. <laughs> <Yeah. so. laughs> he attends to the spiritual needs of the students who uh, the can't find it in the non-believers, yeah. Non I mean, everybody has, actually, that's one of the themes of the book. Everybody has spiritual needs, and so why not? Anyway, so I try in this debate, um, you know, and I try to make the theist argument very, very strong, stronger than the ones I've heard, I have to say. <laughs> um, what's the good of knocking down a, a weak argument? I really, I try to make it as strong as possible. And when I read it to some of our uh, atheist friends, they, it made them very nervous. They said they thought I switched sides because I really tried to make the theist side extremely strong. But Cass, I think, well, even there, I've heard disagreements. I think he wins the argument. Um, but the thing, the wonderful thing about fiction, again, as opposed to a straight philosophical work, is that it leaves, a, it leaves room for the reader to bring his or her own experience and make of what happens what he or she will. It's, it's, it, there, it, fiction is so capacious, and there's room uh, for many different experiences to go into that, uh, to the reading of it. And so I have read people who are, have strong religious beliefs say that they felt vindicated when they read my novel. And I, I like that. I actually like that. I, I feel that I mean, a novel should not be pushing a particular point of view. That seems to me a weakness uh, in a novel. So, um, so I'm not going to answer your question. <laughs> Do I, do I have your permission to uh, retell one of your jokes that you put in the mouth of the agnostic yes, chaplain? Yes, he tells it better than I do, so <laughs> yes. So this is the um, uh, debate is at Harvard, Resolved God Exists, is hosted and presided over by the agnostic chaplaincy. Uh, and the agnostic chaplain explains the uh, world view of the agnostic, uh, agnostic chaplaincy by Tell, retelling an old Jewish joke, which is that there's a uh, rabbi in a small village in Eastern Europe, and he is the, uh, basically in charge of all of the uh, affairs of, his, uh, of his, his flock, his constituents, uh, including ordinary counseling. And one day, a squabbling couple comes to see him. Uh, and the, first, he listens to the story of the wife who goes on and on about how all the problems in the marriage are caused by uh, her no good husband. He listens and he says, you know, you're right. Then she leaves and the husband comes in and he explains how all the problems in the marriage are uh, the fault of his shrewish wife. And the rabbi listens and he says, you know, you're right. Then when the husband leaves, the rabbi's wife, who's been eavesdropping the whole time, comes in and says, what did you think you were doing in there? They, First you listen to one, you say that he's right. Then you listen to the other, you say that she's right. They can't both be right. He says, you know, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the, the, the credo of the uh, agnostic chaplaincy at Harvard. <laughs> well, I think we've um, 
perhaps now we will open it up to some questions. Oh, but you didn't ask me about my favorite character. Oh, I'm sorry. We left out the, uh, yes, the, heart, the, of the, the heart of the book. There's one <laughs> other character before we begin, and who uh, also exemplifies one of the great uh, impulses that find expression in religion. Yeah. Good. So there's this kid, and his name is Azaria. And, um, you know, again, when you, um, you can talk about religion versus faith, but if you're going to deal with this in a novel, it can't be religion in general. It has to be a specific religion. You have to make it concrete. That's what a novelist does. Um, and I, when I had to come about to make it concrete, choose a religion, it happened to be Judaism. Uh, it's the one I know very well, and it, there, it's not an arbitrary choice either in representing monotheism, uh, to start with the mother religion, uh, Judaism. And I take a, an extreme form uh, of Judaism, one, again, that I know very well, Hasidism, uh, where you know, there are these different sects, and each of them follows a charismatic rabbi. Um, and the position of rabbi is handed down from father to son. Um, and it's an extremely insular community. Uh, and they, they generally, at least in the United States, don't even speak English. Uh, they still speak Yiddish. Um, or they'll speak English with a, with a real accent. Uh, these are third or fourth generation people, who are Americans, uh, who, who, who still really uh, speak as if they just came over on the boat. And the character, Azaria, is the, the rabbi's son. Uh, so he's destined to be rabbi himself someday. And he is an, uh, he's a mathematical prodigy. Uh, he's an extraordinary child. We first meet him when he's six years old. Um, and he's, uh, I mean, and this is, I mean, I've been um, uh, intrigued, fascinated by mathematical genius uh, for a very long time. One of my books is about uh, Kurt Gödel, one of the great, great mathematicians, and his proof. Um, and there is something um, otherworldly, both about mathematics, um, which is not empirically, it's not, its source is not an empirical observation. It can't be falsified through empirical observation. If it's descriptive, what's it describing? Many people are what we call mathematical Platonists. They believe that these eternal truths uh, describe some trans-empirical, non-spatio, non-temporal universe. There's something um, mysterious about this. And indeed, there's something can be something mysterious about its the emergence of mathematical talent in very young people. So Azaria uh, has this capacity. He's something extraordinary. Cass Seltzer meets him when Cass himself is a graduate student under the tutelage of, of Clapper. Who, um, and, and Cass understands, he alone understands what he's confronting here. Uh, everybody in his community, in, in Azaria's community, has no idea uh, what, what this person is. They value him. Uh, they revere him, but only because of his bloodline, uh, because he is the son of the Rebbe, who is the son of the Rebbe, who is the son of the Rebbe. Um, and and uh, Azaria, for me, I mean, he goes, he, he, there's a, a dilemma that Azaria has as he matures uh, that to me is, is very much the heart, of, uh, the heart of the book and that shows that religion is about way more uh, than belief in God. <clears throat> and the, uh, the, the uh, contact between number, the, the concept of number, the sense of number, these mysterious entities, and the sense of God is played out in Jewish mysticism in the gematria, the yeah. practice of trying to read hidden meanings in the uh, numerical value of a particular word. In Hebrew, each letter, of course, also stands for a number. So if you convert someone's name into numbers and then look at the even, odd, prime, and so on, you are uh, uh, tempted to divine uh, hidden meanings in the nature of the name. And uh, in Kabbalah, which incongruously has recently been made famous by Madonna, who has uh, adopted it, but there's a, a little bit of Kabbalah in the novel as well. Yeah, there's a, there's a little bit. And actually, in those ancient texts of Kabbalah, there's some very good mathematical discoveries. Um, the affinity between uh, this mystical viewpoint and mathematics is uh, actually cashed out in some really good mathematics. 